Ladies and gentlemen, I'd uh, like to welcome you back to the afternoon session of the Causeway Education Conference, Partnerships for Change. My name's Rob McMenemy. I'm the uh, chair of the trustees of Causeway. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker. Uh, Martin Lewis, in fact, requires very little introduction. Journalist, author, broadcaster, and highly successful businessman, he has, over the last 15 years, established himself as probably the country's leading consumer champion, even taking on the might of Facebook. And he is, of course, the man behind the hugely successful moneysavingexpert.com. In the broadest sense, Martin is also a passionate advocate for change in the field of education, whether it be campaigning on student loans or personally funding initiatives such as My Money Week, a three-year program in schools to help improve young people's understanding of money matters. He is also the founder and chair of Money and Mental Health Policy Institute charity. Now, at the end of Martin's speech, uh, there will be time for questions, so please get your thoughts on and get those questions together. But we are absolutely delighted that he is able to join our conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Lewis. Thank you very much for that. Now, to start with, I should explain why I walk up and down. It's two reasons. One, a very long time ago, I used to be a standard comic stand-up comic, and they always taught me, make sure you look your entire audience in the eye. And the other reason, I've only done 21,000 steps so far today, I need to get to 25, and I can't stop just because I'm talking to you lot. <laughs> now, when they invited me here, I was in two minds what I was going to talk about, and Rob has eloquently mentioned two of my passions, which involve the people in the room. One is financial education. We, in 2014, after a three-year fight, managed to get financial education onto the national curriculum in England. Uh, at the time, I was asked by a newspaper what I thought, and I said, that's the thing I'd like on my gravestone, you know. But it was a pyrrhic victory. Because we got it on the national curriculum, the government did it as a tick box exercise to get me off their backs, and they put no resource into it. No change to teacher training. No change to ongoing teacher training. Absolutely nothing has changed. Ofsted has effectively shrugged their shoulders and said there aren't the resources to get this done properly. I'm not saying some schools don't do it very well, but certainly we are nowhere near the point that I would like to see where every child in this country is fully equipped and tooled up to deal with what this is, one of the world's most competitive consumer economies. I'm working with Young Money at the moment. Um, I gave up. The government should be putting resources in. I don't like the idea of banks paying for things to go in schools because they brand it and it becomes a brand and branding and sales exercise primarily, not always, but often. So I'm working with Young Money, and, and I'm paying for a textbook to go to every child in every school that we're in the middle of writing at the moment that will happen at the end of this year. No private individual should be paying for it. It is one of those things, a bit like the Facebook campaign yesterday, that I wish I didn't have to do, but is enough is enough. It has to be done, so I will do it, but castigate the government for the fact that I need to do it. But that isn't what I'm going to talk about today. I thought I'd talk to you about student finance, which is another passion of mine. Um, I got involved in this when I was a university president, a student union president at the LSE, or general secretary as we called it. And then at the time, a, a lovely couple of chaps called Nick Barney and Crawford invented what we now have, the income contingent loan repayment system, which is how it works these days. And I was the lead of their student guinea pig panel onto how it worked way back then. Who knew, eh? And since I then chaired the task force, the independent task force on student finance information at the change in 2012, not because I agree with the system, but because, and this is the most important thing I want you to take home, those of us who communicate student finance have a very important decision to make. Are we going to communicate the politics of student finance or are we going to communicate the practical reality for students? And I'm afraid this entire nation, our politicians, most of the media, and many teachers, 
have focused on the first, at the vast detriment of every single child in this country. We talk about student finance in the wrong way. Some people do it knowingly. I won't tell you who, but I've spoken to people who represent students and people who come from a more left-wing background, and there's nothing wrong with their policy, who when I've explained how it should be talked about, they go, we absolutely agree with you, but if we spoke about it the way you wanted to speak about it, it would weaken our argument for change, so we prefer to keep talking about it the way it does right now, because it scares people. I don't want students to be scared off. I don't give a monkeys whether Jeremy Corbyn wins and we get rid of tuition fees. That is a political decision over where the pendulum is, who pays, the individual or the taxpayer. That's what that debate is about. That is not my debate. My debate is we look at a system, we see how it works, and we tell the people who are going to go how it will work for them. And if you don't do that, the net result is the people who are most scared are those from non-traditional university backgrounds. They're the ones who don't go, and I care about social equality. And we have a review of student finance going to happen very soon. And I am already petrified, because already the conversation is about fixing the perceived problems, not the actual problems. And actually, if we're going to tweak the nipples of the current system, then what we need to do is, first of all, make sure people understand it. I will give you a couple of examples, and I will do it by means of illustration. Anyone good at maths? Is there a maths teacher in the house? Come on, someone here is good. Who's got maths A level? Hands up if you've got a maths A level. Come on, hands go up like th this gentleman here. Thank you, sir. Well done. You look like a maths teacher. It's fine. That'll do. Right, what's your name? Steve. Steve, don't worry. It's not going to be that difficult. This is what I really want everybody to understand. What counts in student finance is you repay 9% of everything you earn above £25,000, and you, this is in England and Wales under Plan 2 terms, and you do that for 30 years or until you have cleared what you owe plus the interest added on top. That's what counts. Now, let's just do this, Steve. Are you ready? You earn... No, do it differently. You owe, you're borrowing, £20,000. You earn £35,000. How much do you repay? So £35,000 is 10000 above £25,000. <laughs> 9% 9 of everything above £25,000. 9% of 10000 is £900. So you earn 35000 Well done. You earn 35000 C minus. You earn 35000 your borrowing's 20,000, you repay 900 pounds. Now let's take somebody else, somebody who borrowed 50,000 near the top end and earns 35,000 pounds. How much do they repay? 900 pounds. Oh no, people! The nasty government of the unnamed party, because we're not being polemic, has just put tuition fees up to 1 million pounds a year. You're graduating with a 3 million and about 20,000 pounds of maintenance loans debt. 3 million and 20,000 pounds debt. You earn 35,000 pounds. How much do you repay? 900 pounds a year. What you borrow and the interest added on top does not impact what you repay each year. The only thing it impacts is whether or not you will clear within the 30 years before the debt wipes. Now, the current analysis from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, this is really important that you get your heads around this, because it changes the whole debate. The current analysis from the Institute of Fiscal Studies is that 83% of current students will not clear their debt in the 30 years Full stop. Only 17% will. Poorer 17% or richer 17%? It's actually a trick question. We always talk about poor or rich. Do we mean poor or rich before you go to university or poor or rich after you leave university? The highest earning 17% of graduates or those who chose to borrow slightly less are the ones most likely to repay in full in the 30 years. Have you all got that in your heads? Because now we move on to the meat of this.
let's have a look at some of the policy implications that people are talking about. The government has talked about cutting tuition fees in some courses that it's not that keen on, down to £6,000. Now, apart from the absolute random nonsense of they're trying to encourage people to do the more expensive courses and cutting the price of the cheaper ones doesn't seem to follow any form of market logic I've ever heard of. But anyway, let's ignore that. Let's just look at the impact of cutting tuition fees on some courses to £6,000. This is staggering when you think about it. Who benefits? Who would save money by cutting tuition fees to £6,000? The only people who would gain are those who would repay in full at £6,000 plus maintenance within 30 years. Now, on my back of the envelope calculation, you've got the 17% who are repaying anyway, in full, and probably another 10, 12, 13%. So let's call it the top 30% of graduate earners, which is roughly someone on a starting salary, get ready for this, teachers and people who work in universities, starting salary, starting salary of £35,000 a year and above inflation rises afterwards. City bankers, city lawyers, city accountants, some GPs, some people who do... Oh, no, I'm way richer than that. <laughs> um, way, way richer. And in fact, most broadcasters wouldn't come close to it. I'm one of the few journalist broadcasters who's made a lot of money, but I've made up for the rest of them, so it's fine. Now... <laughs> wouldn't come close to repaying that. So they're the only people who repay. So what we do by cutting tuition fees, in effect, if we stick within the current system, and that's very important to understand, this isn't about the bigger, you know, do we get rid of tuition fees, this is about the nipple tweaking of the current system, is we give money to the highest earning graduates and we take money away from universities. So we take money away from the quality of education. So cutting tuition fees, while an incredibly popular concept, while it appears, appeals to the misperceptions of university education, is regressive within the university system. Because what it does is it gives money to the highest earners and it decreases the money of universities, therefore decreases the quality of education for everybody. That, for me, is not how we should make policy. We should make policy based on the real impact the fact it may be unpopular with the public says to me that we're not communicating how it really works. Because if it doesn't really work the way the public thinks, maybe that's the first challenge. Which is why, and I'll come on to this later, I'm hugely in favour of renaming the entire system. It is not a loan. It does not work like any other form of loan. It's far closer to a form of taxation. I would call it a graduate contribution system, as they do in Australia with a very similar system. Let's take the other one. Interest rates. <gasps> Interest rates. Currently, what's the interest rate for on student loans? Currently? Incorrect. 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 Yeah, we go. Everybody who quotes the interest rate on Plan 2 student loans and gives, tells me it's 6.1% is wrong. While you're at university, it's RPI plus 3%, which is currently 6.1%, but this September almost certainly will rise to 6.3%. After you leave university, if you earn less than £25,000, it's RPI, currently 3.1%, going up to 3.3%. If you earn above £45,000, it's RPI plus 3%, currently 6.1%, going up to 6.3%. And if you're in the middle, it's a sliding scale. So all these newspapers that say student loans interest rate is 6.1%, aren't correct. All the campaigns last year, it's outrageous, the government has increased the interest rates on student loans. That's nonsense. The interest rate on student loans is RPI plus 3% while you're studying. RPI changed. There was no change in policy. It actually was higher in 2012. So first of all, we need to get the myth that interest rate changes out of there. But here's the really big one, and even on the 10 o'clock news when I watched this a week ago, they got it wrong. Because what she said, the correspondent, was the interest rate charged on to students for going to university while they're at university will rise from 6.1% to 6.3%. What's wrong with that? The interest rate charged to students while they go to university will rise from 6.1% to 6.3%. 
No, it's not what's wrong. The, word, the key is the word charged. She also went on to say that they will pay, which makes it even clearer. That's not true. The only people who could pay that rate are the 17% of people who clear in full in the 30 years. The rest, by definition, will not pay all the interest that has been added to their statement. Now, I did a piece, I did a big TV show about interest in student loans on my, on my show. And I was trying to make the very big point that it's interest added, not interest charged. And you have to, interest added is one thing, interest charged is another thing, or interest paid is another thing. I did 14 takes, because even I kept slipping up on it, right? Because it's a difficult language issue, because we make the system that complicated. But let's just look through what, what interest rate is actually paid. Right, let's take this year's current figure, 6.1% while at university, stride, sliding scale between 3.1% and 6.1% once you finish. Let's just take that over the next 30 years. Are you all still following me? Just about. The only people who will pay all the interest added are the 17% of people who clear in full in the 30 years. The next category of earnings down will pay somewhere above the rate of inflation but below the full amount of interest added. The next category down, which I suspect is getting up for the main bulk, but probably between that and the category above, are those who will actually, in practical terms, pay less than the rate of inflation because they won't clear enough to go above the rate of inflation. So for those people, in real repayment terms, their loan has shrunk compared to what they originally borrowed because it's less than the rate of inflation. In other words, if they borrowed 50 shopping trolleys worth of goods, they will only repay less than 50 shopping trolleys worth of goods at the prices at the time they repay it. So they repay less than the rate of inflation. Then there are those who only repay enough to clear some of the capital that they borrowed in the first place. So there's no, their loans are interest free. And then there are those who will never earn over £25,000 and will not repay a penny. Now, I have to tell you, I do have a principled objection to the rate of interest that is added to student loans being above the rate of inflation. I think, in principle, it is wrong to charge students for the cost of financing their education as well as the cost of their education. But in practical terms, it doesn't really make much difference. So I have a wrestle within my own head between my principle and the theory. But if you were to ask me right now, if you were to give me a billion pounds, not for my own pocket, but if you were to give me a billion pounds to improve the lot of students and graduates over student finance, I would not be reducing the rate of interest. That would not be my priority. The biggest problem we have and the biggest problem for social equality is students do not have enough money to live on while they are at university. The problem is with maintenance. And funnily enough, that actually means the loans aren't big enough. And this goes back to my point that every newspaper took 60,000 pound loans, how will students live? That on the package that they ran last night, just after a package about Facebook, which we won't discuss, on the package that they ran last night about the NUS, they had a girl saying, I'm never going to pay off my student loan. Shows that means I'll never be able to get a mortgage. Does not compute for me. Did you? I, 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 I sat there and I was just depressed. I was just depressed because that doesn't make any sense. It's like the parents who come to me, I'm petrified. My child's going to go to university. I didn't go. What happens if they don't get a good job? How will she repay it? She won't have to. She won't have to. This is a no-win, no-fee financially education system. Only financially. Lots of other benefits of going to university, not just finance. And not just how much you earn afterwards. And it's really important. That's one of the other problems with the marketization of university. It only looks at the financial benefit of university. I think it has many other cultural, social, well-being benefits as well. So we have a real problem with the discussion that goes on out there. I mean, the problems with maintenance are wide and varied. A, macro, not enough money. And I know I'm, I'll probably upset some of you. Lots of people, the talk is of bringing back maintenance grants. If you're going to have the current system, 
the only people who are bringing back maintenance grants benefits are the 17% of people who are clear in full in the 30 years. Psychologically, it is a big benefit because nobody understands the system. But if I give you a loan that you won't have to repay, what's the difference between that and a grant? And if we can give people more money in the form of loans rather than in the form of grants, I would prefer that. But I can't sell that because the political classes have misexplained this for so long that they've deadened it in people's heads and think a loan is bad. It should never have been called a loan. Who the hell thought that calling it a loan, not a tax, which the Labour Party, when they introduced it, wanted it to be a loan because they think they didn't want anyone to say they were introducing new taxation. Thought call it a loan would be a good thing. The damage it has done to our society spreads way beyond student finance. Not only does it put people from non-university backgrounds off, it has inured a generation to borrowing. When we give them mandatory enforced borrowing, then they go to university. Then you haven't delineated between that and a credit card, between that and a commercial loan, between that and a payday loan. We have said you have to borrow. And guess what? We've got a debt crisis. It's terribly damaging to call it a form of debt. It's terribly damaging to get rid of the stigma of borrowing by mandatory enforced university borrowing. And we have done that. So, I would increase maintenance loans. I would fix the nightmare that is the, shh, don't tell anyone, parental contribution, but we're not allowed to say it. The parental contribution? Well, no, there's no parent. I've got a letter from Joe Johnson telling me there's no parental contribution. Of course, the amount of maintenance you get depends on your parents' income. And if you've got rich parents, you get less maintenance. But of course, that's totally delinked from the fact that you've got a gap in the amount that you... It's not a parental contribution at all. No, it's just based on parental income. I mean, the system's nonsense. You understand this. When you apply for maintenance, your living grant at university, your living loan at university, the amount you get depends on your residual income, which if you are under 25, unless in some very unusual circumstances, is basically your parents' income. So if your parents have a lot of income, you can have the amount of loan you get reduced by 50%. Now, when I wrote to Joe Johnson saying the system is disingenuous, because it is a parental contribution system, quite clearly, the only factor that changes how much you get is parental income. Therefore, you are effectively implying parents need to meet the gap. He wrote back to me saying, no, you're wrong. Students can meet the gap in any other way they choose, such as by going out to work more, by getting scholarships and grants. And my reply was, well, couldn't the students who get the full loan go and do the same thing? So maybe we should simply say everybody gets a flat rate. If that's your philosophy, give everybody a flat rate, because that makes no logical sense. Or we could be transparent. We could be transparent. And when you write the loan letter, instead of doing what you do now, which says your loan is £6,000, which means people come to me on my roadshows and they say things like, and by the way, those of you who are in schools, tell the kids they need to talk to their parents about this and do this piece of maths. They come to me, the parents, and they say, my fees are £7,000 for Hall of Residence. The, the loan's only £6,000. This is outrageous. The loans aren't big enough. And I say, what about the parental contribution? They say, what parental contribution? And, and I get a look at their loan form and I say, well, the full loan for you would have been £10,000, but your income means it's only £6,000. You're expected to make up £4,000 a year. Why didn't they tell me? Rows between parents and students. Now, look, not every parent can afford the parental contribution. Someone on a big income with a lot of debt will struggle. That's a problem with the system. But transparency, at least, if we're going to have this system, and that doesn't mean I'm approving of it, I'm just explaining it, transparency is important. That loan letter should say, you, your loan is £6,000, the full loan is £10,000, you are getting less because of a parental contribution that is expected of £4,000. The government will never do that in a million years because it will scare the pants off the middle classes. So my compromise solution... And I think we're going to get somewhere with Sam Guillermo on this, frankly. I can't tell you why, but I do. Um, my compromise solution is the letter should at least say, your loan is £6,000. This has been reduced due to the assessment. The full loan is £10,000. Without actually saying, here's the gap. But it's a step further. It's better, isn't it? Might not be perfect, but it's better. I mean, we could go into the farcical nature of this system even more. So let's say you've got a child at university and your parental contribution is £5,000. 
How much do you think paying for your £5,000 a year for your first child reduces your income for assessment purposes when your second child starts at university, or your twin, or your triplets? How much? £1,350. Whatever you're paying, it only reduces it by £1,350. So you've got triplets, you're paying 5000 for the first one, 5000 for the second one, 5000 for the third one. It wouldn't actually work like that because of the assessment system, but for ease of explanation, that only says your income's down by £2,700 because you've got two, so it's £1,350 each. So you're shelling out £15,000, but it's only assessing. It's a nightmare for multiple births, and it's a nightmare for anyone with two siblings who are less than 24 months away or, or less than 36 months away. And we've done the numbers. That's the majority of families. The system is broken. The parental contribution system is broken. Have you heard any of this stuff before? Some of you have. Maybe from me. <laughs> Most people haven't. Most people hear, £60,000 of student loan debt nightmare. What they don't hear is the far more realistic. If your child goes to university then likely, in most cases, for the 30 years after they leave university, they will pay a 9% increased tax rate above £25,000. That's the reality. I'm not saying it's cheap. I'm not saying it's good value. Those are different questions. I'm saying that's the practical financial reality. If you go to university, your tax rate above £25,000 until £45,000 is 29%. If you don't, it is 20%. And it will be for up to 30 years. That's how we should talk about student finance. It's a graduate contribution system. Graduates, not students, contribute in proportion to their financial success after university. They do not have a loan. They do not have a debt. And let me nail this in. My final story to finish before we do the Q&A, if I haven't run over my time. I was doing a talk at the Ideal Home Show. And I had a lady come up to me. Now, some of this, you're going to forgive me because I know there are journalists in the room. This is semi-apocryphal because it's about two years ago and I can't remember the exacts. But take, take the, the nuance being right, even if the numbers and everything is slightly wrong. And she came up to me and she had her daughter in a wheelchair. And she asked me a question. She said, I'm asking this on behalf of my daughter who is paraplegic and can't speak to you. She had, and I can't remember what it was, but it was a catastrophic health issue whilst at university in her last year and she had to leave university and she said she has the full student loan on the back of this that she has to repay and every month we are seeing the interest going up by hundreds of pounds and we are very very scared about it we called the student loan company and said is there any way to reduce the interest because my daughter is paraplegic and in a wheelchair and can't work obviously in this case not obviously, but in this case. Yes, you can voluntar voluntarily overpay. That was the answer they were told. And she said this to me, and I wanted to spit. Because my question was, will your daughter ever be able to work? And that's an important question. And her answer was, we hope so, but certainly not in a graduate form of employment. You know, we're hoping one day she will improve so she's able to do something and contribute back to society. It's a horrendous case. And my answer was, when you get your next student loan statement, I do not want you to open it. I want you to rip it up and put it in the bin. I never want you to open a student loan statement again. It is a farce for you. It is a meaningless farce. Your daughter is never going to earn over the threshold. She is never going to have to earn a penny. The interest added is just nonsense and completely irrelevant. She will never have to pay. Now that is the extreme example of the problem with the system. But I cannot tell, me, tell you how many nurses and graduates on early 20,000 pounds have written to me and said, I'm petrified of the interest, I'm overpaying. Now look, let's just do an easy bit of maths to finish. <laughs> You've got a loan of 50,000 pounds. You earn, and we'll ignore inflation and, and, and all those types of things, you earn £30,000 a year and you're going to earn that for 30 years because real prices haven't changed and you're not moving up in your career and if I did otherwise, it'd be way too complicated for anyone to do even with a calculator, right? You've borrowed £50,000, you earn £30,000 a year. 
you're repaying 9% of £500, £450 a year, you're going to repay that for 30 years. 454,500, so we'll want 13,500 pounds is what you're going to repay, is that right? Thank you. Now, you're going to repay 13,500 pounds, and I know I've oversimplified, but I think that's probably best, in the 30 years. But you've got 50,000 pounds of debt, and you've just inherited or come in or had a bonus at work, which is a one-off bonus you're never going to get, 10,000 pounds. This is a real scenario that I've been asked about. You earn 30,000 pounds and are not going to get pay rises. You pay the £10,000 off your student loan fee because it reduces the interest and I feel better. And I feel better. I've repaid the £10,000 off. The interest is accruing less quickly. Isn't that better? Phew. Whew. What's the net gain to you? Uh -uh. You now owe £40,000 and you're going to repay 9% of everything you earn above £25,000 for 30 years, which is still £13,500. You have just pissed £10,000 down the toilet. Now, the problem with the misname of our system and the problem with the political didactic that says it's a terrible debt and we shouldn't do it and the problem with I'm never going to repay it off is it makes people make decisions like that where they throw away their money. I'll give you one more. Here we go. Last one. Really want to fry your brains. Are you ready? This is the most complicated bit. Who's here from a higher education policy institute? From the, who's here from... Uh, Times Higher. Anyone? Got a Times Higher journalist in the room? No? Oh, I was going to make you do it. Um, <laughs> but Martin, what I don't understand is if 83% of people aren't going to pay off their student loans, who is going to pay? Who is going to pay? Well, first of all, it means the government won't get repaid rather than who is going to repay. But let me just do something fun with you for a second. Okay, so what one tweak could you make to the system? And there are quite a few of these, so that more people repay in full over 30 years. Think interest. Cut the interest rate. If you cut the interest rate on student loans, let's say to inflation, because it's growing less quickly, more people will repay in full over 30 years. Make sense? And what happens to government receipts? Does it get more money or less money? Less. You've cut the interest rate. People stop, finish, stop repaying earlier. More people repay and stop repaying. The government gets less money. We cut the interest rate, the government gets less money, but more people repay. Now 50% oh, now of people repay in full. Phew, isn't that better for the government coffers who gets less money? Now let's increase interest rates to 100%. 100%? Who repays in full? Mr. Zuckerberg. <laughs> only, not even me. Only Mr. Zuckerberg repays in full. 100% of students would not repay in full in 30 years, or 99.99, whatever. Does the government get more or less money? More. But no one's repaying in full. The government gets more money. This entire concept is arbitrary based on the rate of interest that the government sets. So when I hear I will never repay in full, I'm not going to get a mortgage. No, the system is set up to be contributory. You're going to repay for 30 years. It's a graduate contribution system. It's not a loan. Look, if the government actually assessed it based on its real cost of borrowing, which is probably just over 1% or 1.5%, then maybe... It'd be something like 60% would repay what they, the real cost of the government in full over the 30 years. But it doesn't. It sets an arbitrary interest rate figure. And we judge the success of the policy based on that. Now, the government got it wrong in 2012. Their predictions were wrong. Yes, they got that wrong. But you can't judge the success of the system based on the proportion of people who repay in full in 30 years. Because actually, more successful would be less repay in full. 
because the government would earn more if less repaid in full. So the entire, do you see where I go back to the beginning? Most of the arguments that people have are based on total misperceptions of the reality of the system. And that has a real knock-on effect on who we want to go to university and on social equality. And that's why it's time to get rid of the political didactic to stop the parties spitting at each other across the House of Commons and to get out there and to tell young people how it really works. Not that it's cheap, but it's 9% increased tax taxation. Is that going to be worthwhile for you? Do you want to go to university that much? And if you will earn more while you're at you because you've gone to university, then you're going to have to pay more. Just as if you will earn more if you don't go to university and you become a higher rate taxpayer, you're going to have to pay more. It's effectively an additional notch of taxation. And the sooner we start to change the name, change the explanation, and stop allowing politicians to use our young people as a political football, the better our nation will be and the more socially equal it will be. Thank you. One thousand two hundred and twelve steps. <laughs> we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I can already see the hands going up. That's excellent. Um, there's a question down here at the front. Would you say your name and institution? Yeah, um, Elizabeth Garnham from the Office of Students. Um, I just wanted to ask about part-time students in particular, those who are studying modular courses. Um, because from my understanding, that's a, a key area where increased tuition fees have made a big difference and reduced tuition fees at a modular level where people are not necessarily taking student loans uh, would make a big difference. So the reason it's different for part-time students is a very simple one, because it costs part-time students more. The change in 2012 hasn't necessarily cost full-time students, and I did focus on full-time students, you're quite right, hasn't necessarily cost full-time students anymore. It's very complicated, but I now actually get complaints from people on part one loans, so people in England and Wales before 2012, or in Scotland and Northern Ireland since 1998 to the current date, that this, they would prefer to be on part two. They would like to have paid more tuition fees and have the part two loans because your repayment starts at a higher level. Now, the problem with part-time students is because they haven't had maintenance loans and because it's changing, but they haven't had maintenance loans and their borrowing is lower, they are far more likely to actually repay the, the price tag. So in full-time loans, the price tag and what you repay bear very little resemblance to each other. For part-time loans, the price tag is much more realistic price tag. So when we changed the system in 2012, not we, I didn't do it, so when the system was changed in 2012, what we did is we really put the price up for part-time students. And it's very simple. When you put the price up a lot, less people want to do something. And that's what we've done, and we need to fix that. Because actually, part of the future of education is part-time. Certainly of continuing education for people who aren't 18-year-old school leavers. Thank you, a gentleman with the beard there at the back. Mike's just coming. Her name's not Mike. <laughs> I'm Alex from the University of Bristol. Um, I'm just wondering if you've looked into the bursaries that universities provide through their access agreement and what you think best practice is. Well, certainly when we started this back in 2012, I was very scathing of fee reductions. And I think you will all understand why after the conversation that we've just had, because practically it only helped very well off students. I don't know the full details of bursaries, but the big issue here and the thing that puts people off is the cost of living while at university, and bursaries help that. So bursaries, in general, are a better way to help students. And we cannot get over this cost of living issue. When I'm asked honestly about choice of university by parents, I now do have to say, one of the things you need to focus on not the course, the cost of the course will very, is, is, is unlikely to have any bearing on your, the, your pocket in the long run. It won't really make a difference whether it's 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, or 9,000, or 9,250. It won't really make any difference. What counts is your hall fees, cost of living, cost of transport, cost of things that you need for the course. And if you have very little money, and if your parents can't contribute, even if you're going to get a bigger loan, then you're going to need to manage the cost of living and choose your university according to the cost of living. And on the back of that, I was asked at a House of Lords Evidence Committee, did I support, uh, did I support 
that more students should be encouraged to study near their home area to cut costs? And my answer to that was very clear. I think, and I, I think I use Bolton as an example, and you'll see why that was a problem. Um, so I said, look, the problem is that means that for kids who grew up in Bolton, their first choice is Bolton University, and who's going to Oxford and Cambridge? I want equality of access to all institutions across the country, and I don't want the kids who live in Bolton to sit and have to go to Bolton University only. And the man answered me his question said, I'd just like you to note that I'm the vice chancellor of Bolton University. <laughs> it's absolutely true. It may not have been Bolton, but it was close enough. <laughs> absolutely true. And I was like, that, that wasn't my point. I said, it's not sure Bolton's a great institution, but, no, but, but that's the truth. So we, cost of living is really important. And I, you can hear what I care about. It's all about equality of opportunity. I don't, want, I don't care what money your parents have got. I want you to be able to go to the right university for you if it's meritocratic and it's right for you. Right university isn't right for everyone. We've got to get away from the idea that it's right for everyone. But what I don't want and what I've focused on and what I've taken flack and shit about is being criticised for making the system seem less bad. And people have confused that with supporting the system as a big political institution. No. What I want is no young person to not go to university for the wrong reasons. I'm happy for them not to go to university for the right reasons but I don't want them not to go for the wrong reasons. I didn't answer the specifics of your question because I don't know enough about the bursary scheme, but I think that's a general point. Martin, I'm sorry. I think we're going to have to uh, pull it down, I'm afraid. We're uh, being wound up. Yes. We're Thank you all for your time. Up. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I should just stay here for a moment and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll yeah. take you